In about 2004 or so, uh, I read about a uh, project that was um, had got a lot of NH and MRC funding, and uh, it was to work with uh, an Aboriginal community in Australia. And um, the project uh, team actually had to give the money back because um, what had happened was that uh, having got the money, they couldn't get the uh, participants to take part in the, in the whole project. Um, who's ever heard of somebody giving money back to the NH and MRC? Um, but you know, it was like, uh, honey, we forgot to uh, we forgot to talk to the community, uh, and they just weren't interested in participating. And the reason that that stuck in my mind was because. Um, uh, at that time, uh, I was involved with a team who were doing a randomised controlled trial on a self-management program, uh, which was to um, evaluate the uh, use of self-management in the Italian, Greek, Chinese and Vietnamese communities. And uh, members of that team were very... Um, anxious uh, because uh, we were being told all the time by um, called health professionals that there was no way that our uh, project was going to work and it was because um, uh, called, called people uh, didn't do self-management and they didn't understand the concept of self-management and um, that... Uh, uh, they all thought the doctors were God. And uh, those uh, called health professionals always ended up by saying, you know, my mum, who's 67 or 85 or something, uh, she'd never go to a self-management program. Um, you know, she, she's semi-literate, um, blah, blah. And um, I thought at the time, we've got to put this um, myth uh, away. And uh, what we did was that we ran a whole lot of focus groups with older people from those four called communities. And what we found out was that they understood value of self-management, they understood the concept, and they all did self-management uh, when it was offered to them. Doing that work really allayed everybody's anxieties. But what it also did for us was that um, it made us aware of how we had to uh, do the resources. During the focus groups, it became evident that some people, not necessarily literate in their, their own languages or in English, and we had to change the resources to suit them. Uh, you're doing a randomised controlled trial, you've got all these survey tools. They had to be rewritten in the languages, but they also had to be provided in a verbal form. Um, we didn't want to embarrass people um, by saying, well, c can you read this form? What we ended up doing was to provide a whole lot of the resources uh, on audio tapes at the time. Um, and people could just choose how they wanted to respond. Um, the other thing that we found out was that um, there were big cultural differences in uh, how people actually did see um, self-management programs. And uh, it meant that we had to uh, write them and uh, provide the tools uh, in something that was culturally acceptable. So from that perspective, what we did in consulting with all of those um, consumers was that we got a very nuanced understanding before we'd even started. Having done the focus groups, you know, it was a snowball. Uh, it meant that people became really, really interested 
in participating and they passed on that information uh, to all their other um, friends and relatives and, and members of their communities. And um, it made the whole recruitment process um, just that much easier. So engaging with the communities uh, was something that I found really important and also very enriching and um, we had great fun doing it. Yeah. So I hope that um, I hope that you can have some find some of the fun aspect of um, engaging with people and also of um, uh, doing the knowledge exchange. <laughs>